Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 131, 10 Apologists' Mistakes About the Trinity, Part 1. The first thing I want to say as I start off this episode is that I think apologetics is important. I think it's a ministry you see even in the New Testament. As long as there has been a Jesus movement, there have been people who hated the Jesus movement, and there have been people lobbying unfair objections against the Jesus movement, and people claiming that it has no good basis, no basis in reason or experience. And so there have always been Christians who stepped up to the plate and tried to give a loving and reasonable answer to those people. Not every Christian can do that, and clearly the Christian community needs people who are able to give a reasonable defense, and even maybe sometimes to go on the offensive to show how Christian claims are supported by common human experience, by historical evidence, by reason, by human nature, or some other kind of evidence. It doesn't do Christianity any favor to be defended poorly with crummy arguments, arguments which people will find out are crummy at least if they're diligent enough to keep looking into it. What then? Well, the critics will be triumphant, and it might even push a few people towards losing their faith. They might say to themselves, if I've built my faith on this foundation of sand, I think it's going to erode away now, now that I see those were lousy arguments. The second thing I want to say is, it's hard to be an apologist. It's really hard. Most people shouldn't do it. Now, people love arguments, and people love public controversies and disagreements. It's a lot of fun to stick yourself out there and be a big man and refute the bad guys. The problem is that if you make apologetics your calling, it's very hard to be a real expert in more than one or two fields. And if you set yourself up as the person who has more or less the answers to any objection that people are going to give to Christian belief or practice... The pitfall of that is you're going to give pretty good answers in the one or two or three areas that you're competent in. And now what are you going to do with all those other areas? What people do is they just start recycling what the other apologists are saying. And that's a big mix of informed and uninformed opinions. Are you really then serving the cause that you want to serve? And the American evangelical penchant for celebrities plays in here in a bad way. Once a person gets to be famous and kind of hits the standard circuit in evangelical circles, they're then assumed to be competent to talk about apologetics matters, including the Trinity. And sometimes they just have no idea what they're talking about. But hey, they're up on stage, they've got a good suit and tie, maybe they're endorsed by some famous preacher or some other evangelical celebrity, so... They must know what they're talking about, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be talking to a megachurch. I wish it were so. I remember seeing Dr. William Lane Craig interviewed about becoming an apologist, and if I remember right, his advice to a young apologist was, don't do it, or just barely get your feet wet in it. What you need to do is go get graduate degrees in whatever fields you can, and then focus on those areas in apologetics. That's what he's done. His expertise is in philosophy of religion, philosophy of science, cosmology, and those are the things that he tends to focus on. And because he's that educated and that broadly educated, he's better than the average apologist at discerning who is giving a good answer in other fields. He's more able to tell a BS artist from a genuine expert. Another example of a person who's chosen a narrow focus and who's given pretty sure-footed arguments would be Dr. Michael Lycona, who's focused on historical evidence and historical arguments, and specifically the resurrection and the historical reliability of the New Testament. Now, the apologists' mistakes about the Trinity that I'll address in this episode are pretty much all examples that I found in mainstream American evangelical apologists. These are all real examples, sometimes verbatim, either from print or from YouTube. I'm not going to give quotations because I've decided not to call out individuals here. 
It's not that I'm always against calling out individuals. If you're going to get up in front of a meeting of a thousand people, or if you're going to go onto the internet and say something, then I think somebody should be able to come along and correct you. The wounds of a friend are better than the kisses of an enemy. But I don't want the focus to be on particular people. I want the focus to be on the arguments and their merits. So even though when I started preparing this episode, I found a dozen quotations from YouTube and from print sources to illustrate people saying these actual things, I'm not going to use them. Without further ado then, number 10, the Trinity Doctrine is not obviously contradictory, so problem solved. This is maybe the least bad of the 10 apologist mistakes that I'm going to discuss it is an important point that contradictory claims are false. If Trinitarian theory is really contradictory, then yes, it's false. And if we can show that it's not contradictory, that would be an important thing to show because then it might be true. They always make this point by saying, we're not saying that there are three gods and that there's one God, or that there are three divine persons and that there's exactly one divine person. Those would be contradictions. But we're in the clear here, because what we're saying is that there is one God, and that there are three divine persons. Sure, that's correct insofar as it goes. The problem is, it really doesn't go very far. So the mistake is thinking that this solves the problem that people have with the Trinity. The thing is, those who reject Trinitarian theology, and who are really informed about the subject, usually do so because they think that Trinitarian theology is not taught in the Bible and also that Trinitarian theology is inconsistent with what is taught in the Bible. So to point out that it's not contradictory doesn't move them at all. It's kind of missing the point for most critics of Trinitarian theologies. Granted, there are some who think it's obviously contradictory, and sometimes proponents of Trinitarian theology celebrate it as apparently contradictory. But what I just described a minute ago, saying we're not saying there's three gods and one god, we're not saying there's three persons and only one person, I call that the standard opening move about the Trinity. And I have a post about this that I'll link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. I give this example in that post. Imagine that you are describing a soccer game, or what the rest of the world calls football, and you say that right now there are ten on the field, and also there are exactly two on the field. Is that consistent? Well, if what you mean is that there are 10 players on the field and two teams on the field, sure, that's consistent. How about if you say there are 10 bugs on the field and two players? Right, that's consistent too. How about if you say there are 10 players on the field and that right now on the field there are exactly two human beings? That is not consistent because each player just is a certain human being. You can't have more players on the field than you have human beings, given that every different player just is a certain human being. So go back to the Trinity. If the claim is that there is one divine being and three divine persons, here's the thing. A divine person, that sounds like a being. It's a self. It's a thing with will and intellect, a thing that can speak or be spoken to. That's how some beings are. It sounds like a divine person should be a being, and a divine being. But we just said there was only one. So if we say there is exactly one divine being, and that there are exactly three divine persons, the problem would be that any divine person just would be a divine being. Right? That's not consistent. That's saying that there is exactly one divine being, and that it's not the case that there is exactly one divine being. That's implied by saying that there is exactly one divine being and that there are exactly three divine persons, given that a divine person just is a divine being. In the face of this difficulty, some who are trained in theology especially will say this, We don't mean by a person a being. That's a modern conception of personhood. We're using an ancient conception of personhood. Don't you know that some of the words translated person could mean a mask worn by an actor in a play? What we're really saying is that there is exactly one divine being and that there are three personal modes of a divine being. A mode is something like a way that a thing is. It's like a state of affairs or an event that involves that thing. 
okay, this seems consistent, but now we've run smack dab into an equally bad problem. One of the members of the Trinity is supposed to be Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, whatever else you think about him, is a real man. No real man can be a mode of anything. The point of saying that something is a mode is to avoid saying that it's an entity, that it's a being, that it's what Aristotle calls a primary substance. You say, no, this isn't a being, it's just a way that this other being is. It doesn't exist as a being in its own right. That's why you call it a mode. But any human being is a being, a being who has modes himself or herself. So it's hard to see how Jesus Christ could be a mode of anything. He's not a state of affairs or an event that involves some other being. He is a being in his own right. He's a self, a being with knowledge and will and a first-person perspective. So to make this opening move, there's nothing wrong with it on a logical level, but it's a very shallow move. And it doesn't address the main concerns of people who believe in God, but don't believe in the Trinity. Number nine, there has always, or at least since the fourth century, been a single dominant doctrine of the Trinity. The first part of this runs smack against historical facts. It's an anachronism to talk about Trinitarian theology in the first three centuries of Christianity. Now, there is theology that has to do with God, God's Son, and God's Spirit, but there isn't any mainstream theology in those years that concerns itself with a tripersonal God with the idea that the one God in some sense is or contains three equally divine persons. If people believed in the triune God in those centuries, they would have had a word to refer to that triune God. They didn't. The use of the Greek term trios and the Latin term trinitas that we see arising in the late second century that's not referring to a triune God. That's referring to a heavenly or transcendent triad consisting of God, God's Son, and God's Spirit. I call this the Trinity with a small t, following some translators of early Christian theological writings. So then even when you see Tertullian talking about the Trinity in the late 100s or early 200s, he means that in a sense of a triple, a triad, a group of three, He's not saying that they are one God, although he does think they share a substance. Well, that's another story. It's frequently observed that the word Trinity is not in the Bible. The automatic comeback for that is, sure, but words like omniscience or omnipotence are not in the Bible, but they're perfectly good words that we can use to describe what is taught in the Bible. On the level of logic, this is a perfectly correct point. For instance, a work of literature might be discussing the idea that slavery is wrong. And if you read the book, that's just the clear message. The book is asserting that slavery is wrong. And it may actually never say slavery is wrong or slavery is bad or anything like that. And yet it still can be very clearly implied by what is said there, by the stories that are told, by the way the characters are developed, by the things that are and are not said there. This is all correct. But if people believe in a tripersonal God, they're going to have some term or other that they use to refer to that tripersonal God. There isn't any word like that in the Bible. In the New Testament, the word God, New Testament scholars tell us, nearly always refers to the Father. Sometimes, in a handful of passages, the Son can be described as God or addressed as God, and maybe once or twice the Holy Spirit, 
So the word is equivocal, but it's not very confusing because it's almost always used for the Father. The words that we translate as God are never anywhere in the Bible used in order to refer to a tripersonal God. That's surprising if the people that wrote these things believed in a tripersonal God. Imagine that you're writing a book about the history of some country. You're doing this as a historian. You want to give an overall account of that country, how it was in a certain period. I don't know, in the Middle Ages. And suppose that writing as a historian, you believed that this country had a very powerful and important king. And then never anywhere in the course of your whole book do you mention the king by any description, whatever. You don't call him the king, the leader, the ruler. You don't call him George. You don't call him the monarch. You don't have a single term anywhere in your book that refers to this king. That would be really surprising. We would all draw the inference that you did not know about such a thing as the king of that country, this particular powerful, important king. So yes, in principle, the Bible could imply Trinitarian theology without using the word Trinity. But it'd be really surprising if there were people who believed in a tripersonal God and didn't have any word, the meaning of which was to refer to a tripersonal God. They have words to refer to what are later called the persons of the Trinity, but they have no word for the Trinity. They must then not think that it's a thing. Now, I can just imagine how people will push back on this particular point. People will find some quotation from some second century church father that mentions the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and they'll say, see, they believed in the Trinity back then. And if we're talking about the last couple decades of the second century, they might even find a reference to the Trinity, a use of the Greek word trios or the Latin word trinitas. What they can't do is show us one instance where that word is meant to refer to a tripersonal God, the one God understood as tripersonal. You say, but it refers to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Right, but it's a plural referring term in those years. This is the small t trinity that I discuss on the blog. Consider the case of the famous 16th century Unitarian Englishman John Biddle. He writes books about, quote, the Trinity. He discusses the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and he calls them the Trinity. He thinks that all of them are in some sense divine. He's not a Trinitarian, though, because he doesn't say that the one true God is the three of them together. What he says is the one true God is the Father, the Father alone. He's a Unitarian. But he talks about the Trinity, and he mentions the Father, Son, and Spirit. He thinks they all existed before the creation of the world. You find the same in Samuel Clark or Thomas Emlyn from a couple generations later than Biddle. This is the kind of thing you find in Origen, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Justin Martyr. They don't have a word for the triune God. That's because they don't believe in any such. Another related claim here is that Trinitarian language took centuries to develop. But the elements of the Trinity had always been believed. Not true. Here's an element of the Trinity that is an essential core point of Trinitarian doctrine. There's a tripersonal God. That wasn't there. What happened in the first 300 years was a very interesting set of arguments. And prior to 325, the Catholic bishops had not yet then seized the right to discuss these things and to make authoritative pronouncements about these things for all Christians. So in the time of Origen, for instance, you had a much more free-flowing discussion. Origen wasn't even a bishop, and yet he was considered an authority because people respected him as a scholar. Bishops were still quite powerful in Origen's day, but they had not seized for themselves the right of deciding theoretical questions like this. An important precedent was set in 325. The argument still raged on all sides. Some eventually rallied around the new language introduced at Nicaea, but others never did give in to it and thought it was an unhelpful innovation. These are now called, quote, Arians, but that's a polemical label. These are just Catholics who didn't accept the formula of 325. The free argument among Christians was shut down decisively in 381. Actually, a little bit before when a very aggressive Roman emperor decided that the Nicenes were right. That was in the year 380. Another related false claim here is that the Trinity, by which they mean the standard formulas, that these are the product of the very best Christian thinking of the first three centuries. 
you know, we had this big problem to solve that was introduced by the ministry, the life of Jesus, and uh, we puzzled over it. We devoted our best resources and best minds to it for centuries, and eventually this is what we came up with. I wish that's what had happened. The standard Trinitarian language became dominant by way of imperial force. The Emperor Theodosius, after the council in 381, said this is mandatory. He basically outlawed Christianity that didn't go along with those formulas. Now, it doesn't follow that what those formulas are saying, whatever that is, is false. That doesn't follow. Maybe you think this was divine providence, that an emperor steps in and tells all Christians what they must believe, or at least what they must say. Maybe you think it was divine providence that caused the emperor to rout all the non-Nicene Catholics at that time to take away their churches, to depose their bishops, to forbid them from worshiping within the cities, to deprive them of their legal rights. Okay, maybe so. But my point is that the standard language was not concocted by the best minds of the time. It wasn't concocted by leading scholars coming to an agreement. It was concocted by feuding, highly politicized councils of Catholic bishops, which were convened by Roman emperors. It was they who hammered out and voted on this language. When they did it in 325, everybody then proceeded to argue about what that language meant, because there wasn't any one thing that it meant. It was adopted to exclude the Arians in 325. In 381, a large percentage of Christians, I don't know what percentage, I don't know if it was a minority or a majority, but at least a very substantial minority said, no way, we don't think that's right. You're just repeating the stuff that you said at Nicaea and adding to it a little bit. And they were told, you're not Christians, you're going to hell, and your kind of Christianity is not legal. So let's not describe this whole process like it's some kind of scientific discovery, like, I don't know, the discovery of penicillin or of atomic fission. The agreement did not come about in that way. Number eight, Trinitarian theology is obviously implied by Scripture. This is not true, and you can tell that it's not true because of the previous historical point that we just made. Obvious implications are immediately grasped by competent speakers of that language. If the authors are competent to communicate their message, and the people reading are competent to read the writings they will make the obvious inferences that are there. You don't see Christians in the first three centuries believing in a tripersonal God. So it's not obvious, or at least it wasn't obvious then. Now, a somewhat more reasonable view would be to drop the word obviously and just say that Trinitarian theology is implied by Scripture. Okay, good. Let's see how that's so then. Maybe there's some careful chain of reasoning, and people in the first three centuries didn't quite get to the end of that reasoning. There was some barrier there. They, they couldn't decode the words or unpack the meaning of what was really, truly being implied by the authors. Okay, if that's true, it's true, and it's very important. If the main teachings of Scripture are true, or if all the claims of Scripture are true, like the inerrantists believe, then the implications of those teachings are going to have to be true also. Maybe they're really important. Myself, I don't think that this is correct. I've seen all the arguments. Some of them I think are invalid, and some of them I think are valid but unsound. That is, the conclusion really does follow. However, there's a false premise in there somewhere. A more moderate and more defensible view is that Trinitarian theology is what best explains what is said and what is not said in Scripture. And some of the most sophisticated biblical theologians and systematic theologians who are Trinitarians take this view. And if you're going to be Trinitarian, I think this is the view that you have to take. You can't say that the formulas endorsed by the bishops in 381 were obviously implied by Scripture, because nobody picked up on that in earlier years. To say that they're implied, well, that's a really strong claim. Maybe we should just say that Trinitarian theology best fits Scripture. But now what we have to do is compare it to its rivals. And this is practically never done. We have to put on the table what constitutes a good explanation of what's said and not said in Scripture. We have to lay out the criteria for what makes some explanation good. Then we have to put the Trinitarian one there and put it up against its rivals and see which one meets those criteria better. This is really the way the argument has to go. It can't just be focusing on a few favorite passages and saying, see, Trinity. That doesn't work. 
And before we move on, there's another point here. What there has been since the late 4th century is a standard required set of Trinitarian sentences. Those sentences don't obviously express any one theory. In my Trinity entry in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, I describe some Trinitarians as one-self Trinitarians. They believe that the tripersonal God is really one self, and the, quote, persons of the Trinity are, in some sense, modes of that one self. In contrast, some Trinitarians, nowadays often called social Trinitarians, believe that there are three divine selves there, not only one. These are two different theologies. Both of them are trying to go along with and express the correct meaning of the standard Trinitarian language. Other people will refuse to talk about any self in the Trinity, and that's yet a third type of view. So there hasn't been a single dominant doctrine of the Trinity, not even since the late 4th century. What there's been is required language, and people that have agreed with this language and accepted that it's mandatory have held different theories and incompatible theories about the Trinity. And it's not merely a difference of emphasis, as so many theologians like to think. It's not merely that one side emphasizes the oneness more than the threeness, and the other side emphasizes the threeness more than the oneness. Look at the Trinity theories of Richard Swinburne and Brian Leftow. They're incompatible. Generally speaking, the mainstream tradition has refused to clarify the meaning of these formulas. Every so often there comes along a person who says, can't we just make a few simple philosophical distinctions and this Trinitarian language now makes sense? It's self-consistent and even plausible. This was done by Christian philosopher John Philoponus in the 6th century. This was done by a lot of highly educated Anglicans in the 17th and 18th centuries. And many Christian philosophers have stepped up since the latter couple decades of the 20th century and ongoing and have said, well, couldn't it mean this? Generally speaking, these people are ignored or called heretics. People prefer the language to be vague. It's an interesting question why. Number seven, the Trinity doctrine is the Christian view about God. When people strongly emphasize this and lead with this point, I think they're making a couple of rhetorical moves, which are powerful rhetorical moves, but they're not powerful arguments. There is a kernel of truth here, since around the year 400 or a little before, a majority of mainstream Christians has at least officially and on paper endorsed Trinitarian language. And for a long time, most Christians have been Trinitarians, at least in theory. That is, they're members of groups that have this as a part of their charter, basically. That's right. And I think that puts the burden of proof on non-Trinitarians. If this is a majority report, why is it the majority report? Isn't that because it's plausible? Isn't this where any thinking Christian should start? I think that it is simply because of this majority testimony. Of course, you have to listen to that majority testimony with your Bible in your hand, and while you're wide awake and drinking coffee, so you can carefully evaluate their claims and their arguments. That, I think, is a correct point. I do think, though, as I explained earlier, that the appearance of consensus kind of melts away. When you look carefully into it, you see, actually, there's a crowd of competing theories which are inconsistent with one another and that the unity is largely a linguistic unity, and it has a lot to do with the conservatism of Christian institutions and denominations. Not that conservatism is in general a bad thing. But people who lead with the point that the Trinity doctrine is the Christian view about God, I think they're trying to get some rhetorical mileage out of it and not making the point that I just made, 
One thing they're doing is appealing to Christian pride. Some Christians are mighty proud of this insight into the nature of God. They think the doctrine of the Trinity is the crown jewel of Christian theology, and it's the unique thing about Christianity, and everything else pales in comparison. Another move here is that people want to aggressively associate non-Trinitarian theology with other religions or with cults, mainly with Islam and with the Jehovah's Witnesses. So there's an attempt to apply a strong social pressure here. This is our view. This is what we all think. Those people, those outsiders that are not in our group, those people deny this obvious truth. And those people are the Muslims and the Jehovah's Witnesses in particular. And those are our direct competitors. If you're on our side, you'll be a Trinitarian. If you're going to try to be a non-Trinitarian Christian, well, you might as well just be a Muslim or a Jehovah's Witness. The problem with this claim is there were Christians in the first three centuries of Christianity. They were really Christians, and they were really not Trinitarians. And so there have always been non-Trinitarian Christians. These were the mainstream Catholics in the first 300 years and a little more. You also have non-Trinitarian Anabaptists in the Reformation era. You have non-Trinitarian Anglicans in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. You have non-Trinitarian Congregationalist Protestants in America in the early years of the country. And you have miscellaneous non-Trinitarian, which is to say Unitarian Christian groups around today. And no, these people are not all cults or incults. So there are plenty of non-Trinitarian Christians around, and they come in many varieties. Some of them are open theists, some of them are not. Some of them are charismatics, some of them are anti-charismatic. They have different views about church leadership and government and quite how to conduct church life. Some believe in the inerrancy of the scriptures, some don't. Some believe in a substitutionary atonement, some hold a different view of atonement. Really, they're just like other Protestants, except that they are Unitarian in their theology. They say that the one true God is the Father. Other than that, they're basically Protestants. So no, the Trinity Doctrine is not something we all think, if we all are Christians. Another thing that's important to see is that a lot of the Trinitarianism in mainstream Christianity is mostly on paper. Many traditions are in various degrees ambivalent about the Trinity. They've been, some of them kind of bulldozed into including it in their statement of faith, but it doesn't actually play a role in their preaching, in their belief, in their prayer life. This fact is frequently bemoaned by Trinitarians. They say that ordinary Christians are practically Unitarian in their actual belief and practice. Yes, that's true. The reason for it is because they focus on the New Testament. And that's what you see in the New Testament. There's prayer to God in the New Testament, that is, to the Father. There's arguably some prayer to the Son as well. There isn't any prayer to the Holy Spirit or any worship of the Holy Spirit, but there isn't any worship of a triune God as such. There isn't any prayer to a triune God as such. There isn't any reference to a triune God as such. So this is why, in fully Trinitarian denominations, people keep defaulting back to a basically non-Trinitarian understanding of Christian theology. There's a range of attitudes here about this Trinity language that derives from the late 4th century. Protestants have always been somewhat ambivalent, somewhat conflicted about this language. You see in various places Luther and Calvin calling it barbaric or just trying to skip it or suggest that it's not helpful. Protestants have always been more or less ambivalent about small c Catholic tradition. In theory, Protestantism is founded on apostolic tradition. But a lot of Protestants, particularly seminary educated people, think of themselves as Catholics, small c Catholics. And they really do think that that mainstream bishop-run tradition is central to Christianity. This is a strange view because most of these folks are not in bishop-run Christian communities. Many of them never have been. 
So on the one side, there are more creedal traditions that recite the Nicene Creed or later Protestant formulations from the 16th and 17th centuries. On the other side, you have more Bible-oriented Protestants, Anabaptists, Pentecostals, and they never do that sort of thing, some of them. And in theory, they're Trinitarians, but a lot of them could not explain to you what that means or why that's important or anything like that. To a large extent, it's because they just want to be included in the wider ecumenical community. Number six is trite, newfangled summaries of the doctrine. The main one we see these days is that the Trinity doctrine is no more or less than that God is three who's but one what. Of course, the problem with this is that it would seem that every who is a what. And so we can't have fewer what's than we have who's. Another problem is that a who seems to be a self, something that can be spoken to and that can speak back, someone with whom, in principle, you might have a friendship. And some Trinitarians insist on denying that. They say that's the modern sense of the word person. We think God is one who, and that the, quote, persons of the Trinity are just three ways that this one who lives his life or three ways that this one who relates to us, or three roles that this one who plays. But friends, we need to be honest here. It is not honest to say that the historic Trinity doctrine of mainstream Christianity is that God is three who's but one what. That is not an adequate substitute for the language from the Council of Constantinople. We need to not hide that from people. We can't just pat them on the head, hand them this little lollipop to suck on, and send them on their way. Don't you worry your cute little head. That's disrespectful. They're smart enough to ask what the Trinity Doctrine is and why it's important. They're adult enough to hear the history of this, to see the official formulations, and to learn about the arguments that led up to them. Those then are the first five of our ten apologists' mistakes about the Trinity, Tune in next week when we'll go through the remaining five mistakes. This week's thinking music has been New Jersey by Jesse Spillane. I'd like to say thanks to Tom in New Zealand for his recurring donation through PayPal. Really appreciate it, Tom. These little monthly donations are a big help. If you'd like to chip in a couple bucks a month, you can do that using PayPal. Look for the orange buttons to the right of any blog post episode. I was also very happy to get a five-star review in the iTunes store for Germany recently. This is from a user named Chemlan or Chemlan. This person says, Quote, it is difficult to find comparative religion without any preliminary bias. These podcasts are really using all types of historical material to support their argumentation. Well done. End quote. Well, I don't know that I'm bias-free. I don't know if anybody is. But thanks for the review. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to leave a review in the iTunes store for your country, you can find directions on how to do this at trinities.org slash blog slash review. I've done some tweaking to the website lately. You should check it out. There's a better podcast player, some better buttons for subscribing using your Android or Apple phone. And now at the bottom of every blog post, the latest iTunes store reviews are scrolling by. And not just from the U.S. store, but from all over. So please keep those coming. Those do help people to find the Trinities podcast. If you enjoyed this episode of the Trinity's Podcast, please don't forget to share it with friends on social media like Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.